still think this card is really potent against devotion strategies. I don't think it has a lot of game in other matchups because it's pretty easy to kill. It's a little slow and can be targeted by removal spells and all that kind of stuff, which is not what you like out of your format of threats that require you to sacrifice creatures. But against devotion, it speeds up your deck considerably. A Temple of Malady is how Ketter's going to start things here as we are underway in round number five. David Holland with a copy of Nomad Outpost. For Kent, he'll play a copy of Seder Wayfinder. Foul Tongue Invocation is one, Deathness Raptor is two, Temple of Malady is three, and the Nut Forest is number four. So we'll see what Land Kent wants to take off of the Seder Wayfinder, but you can already see the graveyard strategies, synergies, excuse me, getting to work. Exactly. And the key ones here are Dent Protector plus Deathness Raptor, and then Haven of the Spirit Dragon plus Dragons. There's a Temple of Malice. Take a look at the top card. It looks to be a Butcher of the Horde there for Holland. He'll leave that on top. Pass the turn back over to Ketter, who will start by attacking for one with a Seder Wayfinder. Holland going to go down to 19. First blood here in round number five. Kent with a Forest. Now here's a Corsair of Krufix. He'll take a look at the top card. It's a copy of Sansep Citadel and pass the turn back. You will find some wonky lands that enter the battlefield tapped here. There are some Temples, Opulent Palace, Sansep Citadel. Remember, he's... Basically the full five. Yeah, the mana is all over the place. It, it, the core of it is green and black. But you also got Dragon Lord Ojatai, Dragon Lord Tarka, they're all here. The only one that's missing is Dragon Lord Colligan. No one likes that dragon. Here's a Crackling Doom. I'll take care of Corsair. Kent will have to take two as well. Sans Citadel will be turned face down, but that'll be the draw here for Kent this turn. A lot of the other Dragon Lords are just sources of tremendous card advantage, whereas Colgan is just a lot of numbers. A lot of numbers can still be good, but... A lot of numbers can certainly be good. You know, Siege Rhino is a lot of numbers, but for the most part out of your six-mana threats, you want some degree of upfront value, and Colgan does not do a lot of that. Sitter so Wayfinder came in the red zone last turn for Kent, and that was it for his turn outside of playing that Sansep Citadel. So he'll attack for one yet again. There's a Temple of Deceit. Ketter will get the scry. See if Ketter finds something he likes. He's going to leave that card on top. Holland's going to sacrifice the Bloodstay and Meyer, but for David Holland, he's got to get something rocking and rolling here. I mean... Crackling Doom taking care of the course was not a bad thing. Perhaps he doesn't know exactly what he's up against, but the longer this game goes, the tougher it gets for David. Well, there's enough information to work with, I think, if David's got a uh, fluent understanding of standard between Cedar Wayfinder into Death Miss Raptor and the Haven. That, to me, is enough information to work with. We're going to head back Holland's way, though he will fire a Stoke the Flames off at Ketter. Deal four damage to Kent. He put him down to 14. Holland takes the lead as far as life totals are concerned. A little bit behind on the board at this point. Dragon fodder the draw. His deck is Mardu Tokens after all. He actually has copies of Secure the Waste in his deck as well. Yeah, three. That's a, that's a lot of copies of that card. Yeah. Here is Dragon fodder. Two Goblin Tokens passing the turn. We head back Ketter's way. Another Haven of the Spirit Dragon. And now there's a Dragon Lord Dramoka. That one can't be countered, and you can't do anything on your turn for David Holland when that thing hits. But now, we go to Holland's way. This is a really, really powerful card if it stays in play. Oh, yeah. There's Murderous Cut. Yeah, I think killing that is ideal. But this is where the value of the lands come in. David has to win this game pretty quickly, yeah. or else Ken is just going to be able to get Dragon Lord Dramoka back, and all this removal will be for naught. Well, this is a way to try to do that. Dragonlord Colagon, excuse me, not Dragonlord Colagon, Colagon the Storm's Fury, I apologize, gets dashed for five mana. He said he's got to get the game over with fast. That's the way to do it. Yep. There's an Opulent Palace. Some nice synergies with tokens here. Indeed. I don't know if this is a debut next, necessarily for Colagon, but it might be. I'll say this, it's certainly the best it's ever been. Yeah. There's three mana. A Mardu Charm. Are we casting a Coercion here? I think we are. All right, well, good job by David there. Sense that the coast wasn't clear. Yeah. Took care of a Murderous Cut. You get to choose a non-creature, non-land card from the hand. So you can't take the Dragon Lord of Tarka. Damage comes across, puts Ketter down to six. 
David's actually got both Colgons in his deck. Yeah. One Dragon Lord and two Storm's Fury. Kent is going to crack Ava the Spirit Dragon to get back Dragon Lord Dramoka. He will untap. Now the 5 7 back in hand. They'll take a draw step. There is Dragon Lord Dramoka. Pass the turn back. Let's see if Holland has an answer. He did last time. Wait, Butcher of the Horde was the draw. That does not qualify. Does not line up great right now. Tremoka's just got numbers for days. And the fact that he can just continues to get them back. I mean, Haven the Spirit Dragon is a great card in Ken's deck. So, I mean, the, the longer these games go, the worse it gets for Holland, unfortunately. Though his deck really can't take an aggressive slant because he has cards like Rebel Master and Butcher of the Horde. Once we get to this stage, though, Kent's doing way more powerful stuff. David's got a little bit more staying power than most aggressive decks because he's got some funky token synergies, but he's getting outclassed here in a big way. There's Butcher of the Horde. The toughness here for Ketter, it conveniently lines up the Dragon Lord Tarkin's going to be very good. This is nice. Yeah. You know, four and one, and now David's got no stuff, and now you gain five, and David's dead next turn. Pretty good setup. Yeah, these Dragon Lords hit incredibly, incredibly hard. Ketter going to play another copy of Opulent Palace to pass the turn back. His draw for the turn was a Den Protector. That's why you see him kind of leafing through his graveyard to see what he can return, which includes the Death Miss Raptor that's down there. But Dragon Lord Tarka clearing things out. And the thing about these Dragon Lords is they just they close the game really, really fast. He's yep. dead next turn, as you mentioned. It's no joke. Yeah, only Slumgar is really a slow burn. The rest of them kill pretty fast. David Holland going to concede this game. Kent Ketter going to win game number one here over David Holland. Green, black dragons up a game here over Mardu Tokens. We turn our attention to the sideboard. We'll start with Holland and his Mardu Tokens deck. He's got a lot going on on the board. An Outpost Siege, a Thought Siege, an Elspeth's Son's Champion, a Read the Bones, two copies of self and put to Boon, two copies of Ultimate Pride, two copies of Hero's Downfall, two Erase, two Bioblight, one Burn Away. So there's... Only one card here I'm confident will be coming in, which is the burn away. Attacking the graveyard here is, is great for David in this matchup. Yep. When you get past that, there's some okay choices. I think Elspeth is solid here. David can go up to a second copy, but I don't think he wants to play a long game with Kent, so it's dangerous to turn into too much of a late game deck. Self-inflicted wound is good against parts of Kent's deck, but it's also pretty bad against uh, Seder Wayfinder and a couple other cards. The Outpost Siege is much the same story as Elspeth. The game's slow, and typically the card's good in those kind of matches, but there's a risk of David becoming too slow because pound for pound, he can't hang with Kent's cards once they get past turn five or six. I just had things here for Ketter. Three copies of Ultimate Price, another copy of Dragonlord Jamoka on the board, or Dragonlord Salumgar, and Dugan the Spirit Dragon. Three copies of Foul Tongue Invocation, two Duress, two Drown and Sorrow, and two Tasker the Golden Fang. I think Duress and Drown and Sorrow are both fine here. David played enough cards to indicate that he's really on a token-based strategy. So uh, even though Drown's not good against everything that David's doing, I think it's good against enough stuff. The Duresses seem solid here, and I, I think Faltong Invocation could be good in this matchup when backed up with Drown and Sorrow. It's a little sketchy against the tokens, but David also has a lot of four and five mana plays that are high quality, and if Kent's able to attack those with Faltong Invocation, very powerful. We will take a look at the Season 3 schedule here on the Open Series as these players do shuffle up for game number two. We started off with a modern Grand Prix in Charlotte that, of course, was won by Michael Malone last weekend, so congratulations to him. We're here in Indianapolis where we'll be counting a champion tomorrow evening and the next weekend we'll be in Baltimore. Yeah, we head to Baltimore, take a couple weekends off in July, then head to Chicago for the first time in Open Series history. After that, we head to Richmond, then Washington, D.C. for a Legacy Open, a standard Grand Prix in London, which is we just gave you some information for. We'll have more coming down the pipeline as we get closer to that event. A modern Open Series back in Charlotte, and then the Season 3 Invitational in New Jersey, Standard and Legacy as the Invitational formats with a two-day $20,000 Standard Open Series event, August 28th through 30th. Can't forget, for all the main event competitors who play on these Open Series events, you will get your favorite play mat i know it is uh -huh. i know that tassiper is your favorite one so here it is and what's the dog's name again bananas Bana <laughs> bananas the dog the slave dog <laughs> anyhow yep. this is free with every entry bananas the slave dog. you get it when you sign up it's not for the first couple hundred people who sign up we don't mail it to you after the fact you get this free with registration for any season three open series event tassiper the golden paw with yep. bananas the slave, the slave dog the slave dog 
available at all season three open series events. I just can't can't get over that. Yeah. <laughs> Living the dream. It's a happy dog. Yeah. Dogs really don't care about that. You'd be <laughs> you'd be surprised. They just really don't care about that. It's fine. Well, I'm not Dr. Doolittle. I can't actually have a conversation with right. him. Unfortunately. Keter with his green black dragons deck. Had a good deep run with this at the season two invitational. I mean, we haven't really seen anyone doing what he's doing with this sort of strategy. Well, it's, it's derivative of a lot of other strategies. The core of the deck is Seder Wayfinder plus Death Misractor plus Dem Protector. That's your base of card advantage and inevitability. In some spots, these decks have something like Ugin. In some spots, they have things like Elspeth. Kenton said he's playing with dragons. And the major upside is now Haven is a very powerful card in the strategy. I watched the match where Kent went really long against a control deck. I believe it was against Matt Costa, yep. if I recall correctly. And the Havens were a huge part of that. Yeah, the Haven of the Spirit Dragons and some builds of decks like this, Crucible as well, allow for some things that other decks don't have access to. Yeah, and, and there's some analogs to modern where, you know, Raging Ravine is such an important part of, of Jun because you trade a lot of stuff and then you, one of your lands allows you to kill your opponents with essentially the leftovers. Haven is a bit of an analog in, in that respect. Well, players can take a look at their opening hand. David Holland will be on the play here. He'll keep, as will Ketter, so gain number two underway. Blood Sandmire gets sacrificed early. Holland will go down to 19. It'll be a swamp. Magic has a long history of control decks getting a lot of value out of lands, and that being a way to win. Because you want to play it with a lot of lands anyway. You need to make your land shots with these sort of decks, and then be able to convert those into a way to win, whether it's Stalking Sands, whether it's Urza's Factory, Celestial Colonnade, or Haven in this case. Ken with a bunch of lands, two copies of Seder Wayfinder, and a Dragonlord Ojitai. That's going to hit the bin, unsurprisingly, from the thoughts to use. Well, I don't know if it's that unsurprising. I mean, you know, the deck does have Mardu, uh, excuse me, does have Crackling Doom as an answer to a dragon, and the Seder Wayfinders do a lot of work for this deck. It looks innocuous, but that looks like a straightforward take. I'm not so sure it is. Depends a lot on what's going on in David's hand, of course. For sure. Keter will take a draw. Ah, using the upside down method that's starting to pick up with some players. Jonathan Sukinik. Yes. Kind of really putting this on the map. A little piece of tech here. Get Thoughtseize, take the cards that your opponent saw upside down, so you know which cards your opponent hasn't seen yet, and you can play accordingly. There's an Opulent Palace, pass the turn back. Holland will take a draw step. A Temple of Triumph. We'll scry the top card to the bottom. We head back Ketter's way. He'll draw Forest. I would not be able to do this because the upside down cards in my hand would just bother me too much. Could handle it? Yeah. I'd rather lose than play like this. Okay. But I, I could appreciate it as a good piece of technology. Seder Wayfinder will turn over a couple of cards. A Plains of Thoughts, he's another Seder Wayfinder, and a Temple of Deceit. Temple add to the grip, the rest will go to the bin. And then you just draw a firm line in the sand. Right. And now you gotta now you gotta put that temple upside down because your opponent's off the the wayfinder trigger yeah. and now you can't. I don't know. It's just it's just too much. It's just too much for me. Rebel master, goblin, red zone. There's a trade. Gonna try to slow down that goblin a little bit. Ketter will take a draw step. His deck does not have a ton of removal in it. He's got two heroes, downfalls, two murderers, cutting a foul telling vacation in the main deck. He has the ability to sideboard into a lot of removal with three ultimate prices, another two copies, make it three copies actually, a Foul Tongue Invocation on the board, and then two Drowning Sorrows. It's been a really good time for Foul Tongue Invocation, especially since he blocked last turn. To me, that indicates he has an Edict. Not the case. Looks like it's just going to be a Seder Wayfinder. We'll turn over a couple of cards here, and Dragon Lord Remoka, Sylvan Carry added, Corsair Crucifix, Opulent Palace, the only one that he can select. The rest go to the graveyard. Looks to be a Murderous Cut. That'll take care of the Rabbit Master. Either way, it's getting off the board. And this is why I don't think that Thoughtseize on turn one was that straightforward. Uh, you know, those cards look innocuous, the Wayfinders, especially compared to, to Dragonlord Ojitai, but you're seeing Tassiker here on the discount. There's already a Haven in play, so you better be able to win the game quickly if you're going to take Dragonlord Ojitai. Yeah, I appreciate the correction there. I actually thought it was Murder's Cut, but it's Tassiker, which is maybe better than Murder's Cut in this situation. Both excellent. Yeah. I mean, you're just looking for a really solid blocker here. I think it's a little bit worse because now Crackling Doom is... Pretty bad for you. It's, it's live now. It's, speaking of which. Yeah. Crackling Doom going to take care of Tassiger. 
There's your Goblin token. Trigger from Rabble Master is going to make it a three-power creature. The Goblin will join the Bardi as well. And this was the risk of, of Kent offering up that block last turn. I think he probably did it so if he drew Foul Tongue Invocation, he would be able to kill the Rabble Master. But what he did by blocking was give up his ability to double block with two Cedar Wayfinders the following turn. And now he has no answer, or at least no answer in play, and apparently in hand, to the Rabble Master. And he's probably a far way away from casting something significant to block it. This does give him the opportunity to draw a Foul Tongue Invocation if he does have them in his deck still. Does not appear that he did. Temple of Malady. Be the top card, leave that card on top, pass the turn back. So he's going to take a hit here, it looks like. At least one hit. I mean, his hand is nothing until Dragon Lord Jamoka on turn six. He might not get to turn six. Well, keep, he did keep his card on top, so it's a good sign. Maybe there's something good coming off the top of the deck. Looks like it may have been another copy of Tasker. Here's a Temple of Deceit. Top card becomes the bottom card. Then probably Murderer's Cut if he's not casting yep. it. David would like to go to his attack step. I don't think Kent's going to let him do that. Yep. There's Murder. He's trying to take care of the Rabble Master. Got to slow those beatdowns. Here's an attack for one. Ketter going to go down to nine. A Caves of Coilus and a passing the turn, so it doesn't look like Colin has very much going on. There is Dragonlord Dramoka. Yeah, the tough thing about this card is, yeah, you can't do anything on Ketter's turn. Yeah. So it makes your turn, even if you have an answer, it makes your turn very inefficient. Now, Crackling Doom was a great draw here. I think David also had Downfall in hand, so he's got, he had good answers for this. There is Downfall. Attack right, for one, pass that turn back. Ketter will take a draw step. There's an Opulent Palace, he'll have to pass back now. It does have Haven of the Spirit Dragon there within his land, so if he wants to go that route to get back the old Dragon Lord, he can. There's an attack for one. Catter staring at a copy of Hero's Downfall. He'll take the one for now. I mean, he could downfall and still return with Haven, but that's such an anemic use of Hero's Downfall. You're, you're looking to get more than that. I mean, it is risky, because if David has another answer to whatever threat you're getting, it's potentially a lot of damage. Here's Outpost Siege. If Kent knew David's hand, he would have definitely killed it. Yeah. Because uh, David's hand's just removal right now, so it's not... It's not free for Kent to take that point of damage. Cons is the name there. Ketter just going to draw a card. Picked up a copy of Dragon Lord Ojutai. So that'll enter the battlefield. A trigger here from Outpost Siege will be a Stoke the Flames. Take a draw step here. Will Holland as well. There's a land. And in combination... This should, should be do lethal. it. I mean, yep. we, we got a Crackling Doom, Stoke the Flames. This will put him from 7 to 5, and attack puts you down to 4, and a Stoke makes this game no more. There is Stoke. That'll take care of it. David Holland going to win game number 2 here over Kent Ketter. Mardu Tokens, Green Black Dragons, get ready for game number 3. And that's the, the vulnerability that Ken's deck can have at times is it's a little slow to do anything of substance. Uh, you know, there's some removal spells that you're trying to use to bridge the gap there, but Ken's deck doesn't really start doing powerful stuff until turn five or turn six. And uh, if you can capitalize on those early stumbles, you can win the game with Ken having resources still undeployed in his hand. It's tough to, it, you know, it's tough to find the right balance because you can have too much removal in your hand and your start can be too slow, but you still need to have some removal to make sure that you can answer the first dragon or two. Striking that balance is very challenging to do, but David was able to do that that game. Well, these players will get ready here for game number three between Green Black Dragons and Mario Tokens. A little earlier in the day, we unveiled this bad boy, Ali Antrazi, and his season two Invitational winning token. Yeah, congratulations to him, featured with his child here. This angel token is going to be available a little bit further down the pipeline for open and IQ registration and orders from StarCityGames.com. And uh, congrats to Ali for winning the Invitational and qualifying for the Players' Championship at the end of the year. Of course, you know, when you win an Invitational, you get $10,000, you get an invite to the Players' Championship, and those things are all great. But having a token of yourself and your young child, Naden, there, that's going awesome. to be something that he never forgets. Yeah, that's a, that's a great... A great accomplishment for Ali and a great prize to have as a result. So congratulations to our Season 2 Invitational Champion, Ali Antrazi. You'll be able to get these just like the Jacob Wilson token, ordering through Star City Games, showing up to Open Series events, all that good stuff. 
But this is the new token at rotation. Of course, Jacob Wilson, our season one invitational winner. He'll be at the Players' Championship, and so will Alian Trazi with this fantastic token. So, so awesome. See, now when someone plays the guys Saint Draft and treat the Angels, mm -hmm. and you see, now we've got a promo Angel token. You made fun of me before when I referenced Decree of Justice. I did, because that card is 100 years old, like you. It doesn't seem it's much not, play. It's actually not 100 years old. It certainly seems like it. It's, I think it's 12, 11? From Scourge? Yes. Hmm. 2015. Onslaught Block. Yeah, Onslaught Block. I think that was like 2012. I, I mean, think. 2002. Or, yeah, excuse me, 2002. We don't see a lot of Decree of Justices, unfortunately. Decrees of Justice, excuse me. That's too bad. I, that was one of my favorite cards when I was growing up. That card was sweet. Cycled, I think, more than Hardcast. Oh, by far. Yeah. And the old Mirari Wake strategy. The sweepers were so good in that format that if you just tapped out to make a bunch of angels... Just kill your stuff. It's a joke. Are you kidding me? Yeah. All right, I'll slide the three of them out or... <laughs> Starstorm you, whatever. Atlanta or Waste is how this game will begin here for Kent Ketter. A mountain here for David Holland. Here is a forest. There's a little acceleration. Sylvan carry added. Pass the turn back over to Holland. Holland with a butcher of the horde in hand. Here's a swamp. He'll pass the turn back. Ketter will take a draw step. That would have been a really good turn for self-inflicted wound out of the board. Yep. That, that's the highest variant sideboard option that David has. It's going to be great sometimes and do nothing a good percentage of the time. Thoughts he's on top of Ketter's deck. We see that from Corsair of Crewfix. Lanner will waste one under the battlefield. That'll trigger the Corsair. Ketter up to 21. Hollow with the battlefield forge at the ready. He's also got a copy of Mardu Charm in hand. Could actually cast a copy of Crackling Doom right now if you'd like to. Looks like he's just going to pass the turn back. Ketter will take a draw. It's a thought seize, of course. Now I would stop Ken in the draw step and Crackling Doom. Fire off that Crackling don't, don't let him get the land. Yeah. Oh, well, we are past that point. Opulent Palace going to enter the battlefield. That'll trigger the Corsair. It's possible David's strategy here is just, I want to save this for the big stuff, which is okay. Yeah, it just seems like it's too unlikely because of the thoughts that you knew was on top of his deck. Uh, right. Now, if he's got a lot of removal rolled up, that's a different thing. You see the hand here, Crackling Doom, Butcher the Horde, Mardu Charm, two copies of Secure the Waste, and then two lands. And given the nature of Ken's hand, I wouldn't be surprised if he just said, take Butcher here, and if you want to play a long game, we can play a long game. I can beat this other stuff. He's going to analyze David's script, and now he'll analyze his own, too. Dragonlord Dramoke over there in hand, Death Mist Raptor 2. His Thought Seize is really going to kind of clear a pathway for how this game's going to go. Looks Butcher like the Horde is the scariest card in David's hand. In combination with those two, secure the waste, I think I have to agree. Yeah. If David happens to top deck an answer for Dragonlord Dramoka, which is Kent's big payoff here, Butcher the Horde can be Kent by itself. There's Death Mist Raptor. Here comes Corsair. There's the attack. Secure the waste will be cast just for two. Nothing too crazy here, just a little baby raise the alarm. And Holland had to take, actually take a point to cast it. But there are the two soldier tokens. Kenner will, excuse me, Holland will take a draw. It's a copy of Temple of Malice. I think Kenner has to like his positioning thus far. Here's Crackling Doom. That's going to take care of the Death Miss Raptor. Yeah, this is great news for Kent. You know, I, if I'm Kent, I would be a little scared because if he's casting Crackling Doom now, that means maybe he's found another answer to my Dragonlord Dramoka that I can cast next turn. Potentially. I would be a little bit scared of that. And it looks like, okay, so we have a, maybe a bit of an issue here. Yeah, where... Yeah. It looks like he played a Bloodstained Mire that he thought was a Temple of Malice. And actually, the artwork in those cards is very similar. Yeah, that's actually regularly been a problem um, that, you know, I've encountered myself certainly doing coverage is often the dual lands that appear inside the same block have relatively similar art pieces of art. Yeah, clearly, clearly an unintentional mistake. Yeah, I mean, he was just playing the Temple of Malice. He just drew, but... 
the blood save iron did enter into play. Yep. It did get ta it did get tapped, which is a legal operation with blood save iron it now. Is. We will have to see how it gets resolved. Yeah, well, of course, we'll have our ruling. We'll let you guys know exactly what the ruling will be. If he'll get to play the Temple of Malice instead, because that was clearly what his intentions were. But as he played the Blood Same Iron, as you mentioned, you can actually tap it for something, which is obviously sacrificing it to search up a mountain or a swamp. We'll get our ruling. We'll communicate it to you guys, and we'll head back down to the match. But for now, we are back here in the booth. Center Films, Patrick Sullivan, Open Series here in Indianapolis. We're in round number five of action. Some big name players in attendance this weekend looking to get some open series points, work their way towards maybe the invite for season three. Yeah, Chris Van Meter jumps to the top of the list as yep. far as I'm concerned for players who, you know, started off a little bit slow, uh, did, definitely struggled in some open series events there for a while, but uh, he is back and he's been having a good stretch of magic, culminating with a second place finish at the Invitational last week in, a couple weekends ago in Columbus, has had a string of good open series finishes and is right now in the mix for the season three invite to the Players' Championship. He's of course playing Devotion, Devotion this weekend. We saw him actually lose the match to Jeff Hogan a little bit earlier. So he has at least one loss this weekend playing Gruner Devotion, but it was such a important part of his Invitational top eight that we saw two weeks ago in Columbus for season two. He did lose in the finals to so his good for Nali Antrazi, but Chris just adding more to his career highlights. That Invitational Top 8, his first one, 17 Open Series Top 8s with four wins. It's been really impressive to watch him play Magic on the Open Series. Yeah, and he goes all the way back. I mean, to the basically the very beginning of the Open Series, he was putting up some very good results. Back when there was a Players Club, he was at the, the ceiling for that. He's played in the Players' Championship. Good, op good Open Series performances, as you see here. Uh, that's a lot of Top 8. 17 is a bunch, four wins. And finally got the Invitational Top 8 monkey off of his back a couple weekends ago in Columbus. Of course, the player that he's trying to chase down right now, the player who has the lead for season three is Ross Merriam. 26 year old from Middleton, Connecticut. And you know, over the past, I'd say year and a half, Ross has really kind of made a name for himself and has broken out in magic. Well, he's had some very good performances in the Invitationals and the Open Series. He recently top eighted his first Grand Prix, which was in Cleveland. And uh, he's a player who I I've always thought the ceiling on his game was very, very high. Likewise. Uh, he has bungled some matches, to put it bluntly, but those matches are occurring less and less frequently, and you're just starting to see the the very, very good player he is a huge percentage of the time. He's an avid Jeopardy fan, big tennis guy as well, and then this this cereal thing is ridiculous to me. Yeah, I don't know what this is all about. Yeah, never puts milk in a cereal, drinks a glass of milk on the side. I, I can't imagine doing that, but right. to each their own, Mr. Merriam. I know he is not in a tennis this week, and I believe he is playing in Grand Prix Providence, so best of luck there, Ross as he's trying to hold strong his lead this week and hoping that no one can pass him. Yep. And it will. Yeah, so the, the, the ruling here is, is that the Bloodstained Mire is just going to be left in play. Uh, you saw him take a look at the top card, so he'll get a warning for looking at extra cards. Mm -hmm. We're able to repair the game state, move forward accordingly. So there we go. Because there was nothing illegal about playing the Bloodstained Mire. Correct. There was something illegal about him looking at the top part of the deck after playing the Bloodstained Mire. So warning for looking at extra cards. Bloodstained Mire's in play. We move on with life. A windswept teeth will search up a plains. And now here comes Dragon Lord Dromoka, I imagine. Well, the top card has to be revealed there with Corsair, which is another copy of Corsair. And now here is Dragon Lord Dromoka. Corsair going to come into the red zone. Holland going to go down to 14. And he had better find an answer for this thing, or he can run away with the game like we've already seen Ketter do once. It has been a lot, it has been a lot of fun trying to, pe trying to see people kind of incorporate the Dragon Lord Dromoka. I know that some people have been trying it side by side with Xenagos, mm -hmm. God of Revels because they can't, once it's in, on the battlefield, you can't do anything about it. You double its power, you give it haste, you get in for 10, you gain 10 life. It's a pretty sweet combination of cards and a Naya Dragon strategy. Can't be countered alongside your opponent, can't play spells on your turn. It's an incentive to try to combo out. Yeah. Now, the, the card has great numbers, and if you're playing against any sort of a, aggressive strategy, if it sticks, it's going to be game over. And I think that's where you're largely going to see Dragon Lord Tremoka show up in decks. It's just as a way to beat certain mid-range and certainly beat down strategies but you are right with, with that clause on the card it's telling you find some way to give this thing haste find a way to give this thing a lot of stats the turn you're playing it and god of revels is probably the best card in standard to that end it's a goblin rabble master it's a goblin it's getting blocked yep david probably wanted to cast that one post combat yeah Probably doesn't matter a lot in the scheme of things because if you can't kill Dragon Lord Dramoka, it's going to kill. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter that much, but yeah. that one you want to do post-combat. There's Temple of Malice. He gets the scry here. Top card's going to go to the bottom. 
Because I think Ken is likely to block there. It's a tough bluff. That's a really <laughs> tough bluff. You're not buying, huh? No. Murderous cuts on top of the deck now. And now we're entering the stage of the game where even if David is able to cobble together removal spells for the Dragon Lord, those, those havens are going to bury him. It really almost feels like Ken's deck is, more than anything, a Haven of the Spirit Dragon deck. Well, it, it, it's so innocuous. It's just a land in a deck that wants to play with a lot of lands. But when you get to this stage of the game, the dragons are so powerful individually that your opponent often only has one removal spell that can take care of anyone. The numbers are so big. And then we get into this spot where how is he supposed to beat this without exiling the dragon? Yeah. Cutter played a land. After that, Courser gained two life. He went up to 28. Now it's time for a Courser. Excuse me, a carry added. Now pass the turn back. Murder's cut on top of the deck. Another Haven in hand. If this deck ever became more popular, I think that you would see a huge uptick in Utter End and Silence of Believers because you have to exile this stuff. Yeah. Unless you're clocking your opponent really, really fast, you, you can't play this long game where they're generating this much value off their lands. And you can see David is kind of shrugging his shoulders saying, well, I got to cast this Crackling Doom. But it doesn't really amount to much long term. And also his hands are tied. He has to cast it now because of the text on Dragon Lord Jamoka. Yep. He, he can't wait till Kent's turn because Jamoka doesn't let you do that. So his hands are certainly tied at that one. He gets a goblin token here. That's yeah, you see Kent already grabbing at his a block. Yep. Yep, there's your block. See you later. There's a bloodstained mire. Pass the turn back over to Ketter. Murders cuts the draw. We'll see the next card which is a Den Protector. Yeah, exiling is a huge deal against Kent's deck because of a card like Den Protector, too. We yeah. didn't really talk about that. Here come the Coursers. They'll get chump blocked by two soldiers. Secure the Waste did not have much of an impact on this particular game. Kent are just going to pass the turn back with Murderous Cut at the ready. Kent's also getting ready to sacrifice his Haven of the Spirit Dragon to get back Dragon Lord Dramoka. Mm -hmm. He feels like he's in the driver's seat right now, and it's uh, it's pretty tough to argue. Interesting to see Kent just not get back Dragon Lord Dramoka straight away and recast. Yeah, I suppose maybe he was scared of something. We'll see. There's a murderous cut. Now he'll get back the Dragon Lord. He'll untap. The draw step for the turn will be Den Protector. Next card down is a Tassiger. Really a deck that just uses its graveyard as a resource between Delving, between Returning Dragons, and of course Den Protector. Ketter going to put Holland down to one, which means that Bloodstained Mire, that's off now. Battlefield Force providing white mana, that's not an option either, it appears. There's a copy of Secure the Waste. This might be before blockers. We'll have to see. Otherwise, this gets a touch awkward. Yeah, and the problem is now the Bloodstained Mire's been tapped. Yeah. And I do not believe there's an Urborg in play. And there's only one white source of mana here, which is Battlefield Forge, which does a point of damage. Yeah, so that's going to do it A lot there. of awkwardness here, but we're done. <laughs> Kent was going to probably go on to win this game anyway. Right. Yeah. No harm done, but uh, not, not the smoothest, most elegant ending, but a conclusion all the same. A win is a win is a win is a win here for Kent Ketter. He wins this match two games to one over David Holland. Green Black Dragons will take care of Mardu Tokens. And as we'll probably have Kent in the sideboard, he's a lively interview anyway, but he's got a pretty unique deck here in his Green Black Dragons deck. He played this at the Season 2 Invitational, as we mentioned, had a really good run there, and he's off to a 5-0 start here. And it's really easy when you, when you see decks like this to, to get really focused on the...